Hello everyone and welcome to Leadership Live Australia. I'm Byron Connolly and today I'm joined by Veteran Government Technology Exec, uh, Glenn Archer. And Glenn has held roles at Centrelink, the Department of Education and Department of Finance. So he's had plenty of experience working in teams to deploy technology across government. He's also spent two years as Vice President for Digital Government at Gartner, more recently a year supporting the New South Wales Government on a major tech project. And he's now a visiting fellow at the Australian National University. Glenn Archer, thanks for joining me today on Leadership Live. Thank you, Ryan. Great to have you. Now, Glenn, you do have some strong views about the failings of digitisation programs across government. We've seen a number of examples in recent times, which we will discuss shortly. But let me start by asking, what in your view are the fundamental reasons that tech projects across uh, the Australian government continue to undeliver what, what has been promised or, or, or flat out fail? I mean, is it a lack of leadership or governance or, or a bit of both? I mean, what else is at play here? What's your view on that? Yeah, so just to, yeah, your leading comment about having strong views, uh, I am pretty passionate about this space. I put a large amount of my career into this and, and I do see uh, technology as a really important uh, enabler uh, for, to allow governments, uh, you know, to deliver better services, to implement their programs, um, to make government work more efficiently and effectively, um, you know, simplify the life of, of uh, citizens and businesses throughout Australia. Um, and, and, you know, there are lots of reasons why IT is important. And, and uh, personally, you know, the, the Australian Public Service, I think, is a fantastic uh, entity and, and uh, can, can work more efficiently through, through IT. Uh, you know, in terms of the actual question, I think there's a, lot of, uh, there's a number of issues there that, to unpack. Um, um, on, the, on the governance front, yeah, that's a fundamental thing. Um, I remember in late 2014, not long after I uh, resigned, um, the finance minister uh, issued a direction to shut down all of the ICT governance bodies, uh, the Secretary's ICT Governance Board, uh, the CIO committee, uh, the Authentication Governance Committee, and the Cross-Jurisdictional cross CIO Committee. They were the sort of four peak entities that, that uh, managed how government, uh, you know, implemented and advised ministers on IT. Um, and they're all literally shut down. And I think, you know, in, in large part, um, that decision uh, contributed to DTOs, uh, the Digital Transformation Officers, um, which was the entity that existed uh, between the end of Ajimo or the shutting down of Ajimo and the creation of the DTA. Uh, anyway, so that decision, I think, you know, uh, contributed to the failure of the DTA to kind of gain uh, traction. Uh, it, it, its existence was announced um, about two weeks after then. Um, and I, I remember having coffee with Randall Brogard uh, in about 2019 and uh, mentioned that, and he, he, his response was that, you know, it had taken them uh, a, a couple of years to kind of re-establish all that governance um, or, you know, in parallel governance arrangements. Um, perhaps, uh, you know, that was a bit too, it had, had, had taken them too long to do that. Um, leadership is certainly a major issue. Um, not least uh, because uh, we've had so many of them. Um, oh, particularly uh, the DTA, there's been so many chief executives over the years, hasn't there? <laughs> uh, I mean, if you include the acting ones, which are usually acting for about, you know, between three and six months, mm. I think we've had seven. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 must be, I, I lost count. Um, yeah. Um, and it, it, is, it is really a problem. And, and, in fact, the staff turnover in DTA generally at all levels in the organisation I think, yeah, that's been the subject of a lot of debate uh, in the media. Uh, yeah. And I know that internally in the organisation, it's been quite traumatic. Um, there's been, you know, little uh, continuity and, and that can certainly undermine, um, you know, progressing major initiatives. Um, fundamentally, though, you know, there's kind of a small number of issues, I think. Um, number one, uh, a, a radical shift in terms of the over-reliance on consulting firms um, and, uh, you know, to lead not just uh, strategic initiatives, which is, you know, which has been, they've been used in the past in that space, um, or strategic analysis perhaps, um, but also to lead big program changes. Um, and um, aside from, you know, our, the, uh, the, the, the value of that advice or product or service, uh, which, you know, some people have questioned, um, the resulting loss of skills and expertise internally has really damaged uh, the interests of the APS. 
um, you know, we we did some we did look at this at a demo, and um, you know the when you can rely on internal staff to quickly change the system, uh, that government wants to implement something in you know in three months' time. Um, if you've got the internal staff with the skills and the technical uh, nous to do that, it's it, it's often achievable. If you've got to go to market and run a tender process and an evaluation, it's simply not. Um, if you've got existing uh, you know, outsourced staff leading you, you've got to negotiate a contract amendment or a change or some new initiative. You've got to, you know, often uh, find your way around the procurement rules that are in place um, in that space, and that can be incredibly problematic. Um, and then there are all of the issues that come with relying on third parties um, in that space anyway in terms of uh, corporate memory. Uh, and, uh, you know, often people love to say government should be more like business um, and operate more like business. It's just not true. Uh, and I say that because government policies uh, survive forever. Uh, you know, the tax system is with us forever. Uh, Social Security is with us forever. The 150-odd different programs that, uh, that Centrelink, or sorry, Services Australia run, you know, they, they often have, you know, grandfather conditions or, or um, complex arrangements for changes in program over time. Um, no bank would ever uh, tolerate that. Um, you know, that, that they would simply move to adjust immediately and apply that. That's exactly the government right. is not allowed to do that. And yeah. so corporate memory and IT memory is, is, is really critical. And I can tell you from my time in Sydney, uh, it was very, very common for the policy owners and program managers in the business side of Sydney to go to the IT people to ask questions about how this program uh, operated in the past because they could rely on the fact that IT had, had coded that and often those same people were there. Uh, so, so the corporate memory I know at the time was actually often held in IT. Um, when you have turnover through outsourced arrangements, that that, that goes away. Yeah. Um, sorry, you were going to yeah, say sorry, something? Yeah, sorry, you had one, one thing to add to that? Uh, so there's a couple of other things. I think, you know, failing uh, to demand that agencies work better together, uh, you know, uh, DTA... Um, uh, in part was established with additional authority that the DTO never had uh, to kind of demand that agencies could collaborate and work effectively together to build systems that were much more tightly integrated. Uh, and I think it failed uh, very poorly in that, in that space. And that's often, um, you know, visible when you look at systems. You know, in my gov, when you transit from... Um, Services Australia settling through to Medicare or through even Medicare or through to um, you know tax office, the interface changes and it's what why I mean this was some work I did when I was at Gartner you know you want you want to hide uh, from citizens the complexities of government why should I need to know as a citizen that if I want to know something about my superannuation that I have to go to the tax office yeah I mean you know. Those of us who deal with that all the time may know that, but why, as a general citizen, why, why would you need to know that 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 you know that that nuance? Um, uh, often you have you know shifting government priorities has certainly been uh, a challenge. Um, the other the other thing I would say is trust in government IT and trust in government's use of data um, has has fundamentally uh, crashed. And if I could put if I could blame one system and one event, it was the census failure. Um, it was such a traumatic event. Uh, you know, we had the unedifying sight of a prime minister suggesting that heads should roll. Um, and uh, several of the surveys that have done uh, on, you know, do, do citizens trust government IT, you can point to that, that, uh, that time uh, as it was when the decline started and, uh, um, I do, you know, I do think that we underestimated how bad that was going to impact government. Yeah, and we've had some some really high profile cases since. I mean, if you look at, uh, you know, the most serious case being Centrelink's robo debt debacle, which became a legal issue, of course, as everyone knows, and the government had to pay back hundreds of millions of dollars uh, to citizens on top of the, you know, hundreds of millions that were already spent on the project. Um, and as we've just discussed, ETA had a, a revolving door of 
uh, of executives and it's, it's moved away from managing larger projects to basically being an advisory. I mean, where where does the government go from here? We've got to got the Labor government in. Um, you know, what needs to change going forward now? Um, so, look, you know, I guess the question there is kind of framed around DTA, but you mentioned robo debt, so I think it's important to deal with that uh, first. I mean, the algorithm the algorithm behind robo debt um, that was used to detect the kind of overpayments and issue the debt letters. Um, is essentially uh, unchanged from that was used, from that which was used over 20 years ago to identify um, and investigate cases of potential fraud. Um, I know this to be the case, um, and I use the word you know, you know it, it, it explicitly unchanged uh, because you know um, um, we know that most of the cases that were found by the system um, back then were not fraud. Um, they were due to limitations of the data that we had to work with. Uh, you know, Centrelink was dependent on that on that data, and um, but every single one of those cases that we identified back then was manually checked, and it was subject to individual review by a Centrelink staff member before any compliance action was initiated. And as I said, the the vast majority, uh, in in mo in most cases, it was identified that in fact there was probably no fraud and no action was taken. It was simply li just limited data. Limitation. Um, yeah, I think absolutely. the problem with robo-debt, and why I'm going on this is that I don't think robo-debt is an IT failure. Mm. Uh, robo-debt, is, is, it, it was, the, um, I mean, the limitation of that algorithm was ignored and, and people, uh, you know, charged uh, with reviewing the record before, you know, uh, proceeding to uh, write a letter to the, to the citizen, um, you know, that, uh, what, what, what was put in place of that was a, a reversal of the onus of proof. Um, so you were guilty of fraud until you proved to the department that you were not. Um, so that saved, as it were, a staff member within Services Australia. Um, and, uh, and, and many of those students were simply unable to do that. Uh, you know, so, some of these, these points were touched on in the Senate inquiry. Uh, so it's not an example of IT failure, but it, it certainly compromised our future use of emerging kind of automation systems. Because oh, I think, for sure. There um, was lots of pushback, yeah. blowback from that, for yeah. sure. The concept yeah. of automation has been poisoned in the minds of, of, of you know, senior decision makers and ministers. Um, you know, if that algorithm had been tightened up, it might have reduced the number of false positives. Um, but that, was, that wasn't the agenda that was at play at the time. Um, you know, I don't want to say more about this really now, but, you know, the Royal Commission, I think, will expose uh, a lot here and we'll get to learn a bit more about it. And hopefully, you know, some of the benefits of automation, you know, things like the, the single-touch payroll that tax have been working on for a while and that, how that's enabled automation in a whole range of space, um, you know, eventually come back to that. But, you know, do I, you know in terms of, uh, you know, the DTA, um, I think... I think that the really crit critical thing here is that middle letter, that middle letter being transformation. You know? um, uh, I mentioned earlier that, um, you know, it's a, it, it, uh, the DTO and its short-lived um, predecessor of the DTO never, never delivered on anything that could be remotely described as transformative. Um, and, uh, and that's a sad loss. Um, uh, and, you know, the dependency on consultants. Uh, it's not to say that kind of small consultancies aren't valuable uh, or useful, but in the case of kind of big bang initiatives uh, led by some external entity, um, you know, it, I guess in my view, you know, they don't have any skin in the game, uh, really. They just have profit and, you know, an aim to try and continue to, to deliver that. Um, but they don't, you know... They, they almost always fail to deliver on the promise and also almost invariably they end up spending way too much. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because one of the guests that we had on the CO, CO show podcast about the DTA, and this is a direct quote, and she said that the only thing that's been transformed is the bottom line of the big consultant firm. Uh, and everyone agrees with that, obviously. And I guess yeah. that gets to what you're saying there, right? They don't, they don't have as much skin in the so, game as they, as so they that, should. That, yeah, that quote was from Leslie Seebeck from memory. Yeah, I and, think so, yeah. Uh, so yeah. Uh, you, uh, you may not know this, but Leslie worked for me at Ajima. Mm. 
Oh, okay. Uh, so well, fair enough. Okay. <laughs> so, right. well, so, uh, you're on the same page, she, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, well, we are indeed, but also, you know, she has, uh, and she's now in, in uh, the ANU and uh, also and uh, uh, has a very uh, sharp academic mind and uh, yeah, I mm. wouldn't disagree with, with that view at all. Mm. So. Absolutely. Now, Glenn, in terms of the future of the DTA, I mean, there's a, uh, a report coming out from the, uh, the Australian National Audit Office uh, into the, there's an audit into DTA's procurement practices and those findings are due in September. What do you think they're going to, they're going to discover, um, there? Oh, I don't know that I'd want to preempt, um, mm. necessarily what they'll find there. I think, in, uh, well, uh, except to say that, um, we haven't really delivered on many of the, uh, you know, desires or aims in terms of Le leveraging procurement as a mechanism to uh, better support the growth of, of, of capability uh, within within the country uh, for local technology firms, and that's been a recent announcement by the Labor government. I know, so they're probably possibly trying to get ahead of that curve. Um, you know, uh, in 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 uh, trying to um, interact with the various procurement systems that DTA has built, um, they are the most user-friendly and there are often uh, some uh, rather difficult barriers almost put in place to, to that, that prevent a lot of companies from, from uh, accessing or gaining um, you know, revenue from working with government um, simply because they aren't able to comply with uh, some of the requirements. And, uh, and, and uh, um, you know, far be it for me to suggest that um, uh, some of those uh, limitations result in the same, uh, it's always the same names that seem to get mentioned when uh, the contract is awarded. Um, and, and I think that's very unfortunate. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this talent shortage that we're seeing here in Australia, this technology talent shortage, do you think that's having an impact as well or, or not? Because th there yeah. are a lot of roles that are just not being filled, right? Uh, absolutely. I mean, it's it's almost impossible to get staff skilled in certain areas, um, uh, and um, you know, and you know, AI um, and uh, data analysis people, they are an incredible short supply. Yeah, absolutely. Now, um, lastly, again, I'd, lastly, Glenn, I'd like to ask you if you've got any advice for for younger senior tech execs and CIOs, for that matter, who are working in government at the moment. I mean. What do they need to do to make sure their teams and all stakeholders during these these tech deployment processes are delivering what has been promised? What advice would you have for people in government now? Well, obviously, it depends on their level of seniority and you know, what their aspirations are for their career. Uh, one of the things that I think really separates, you know, really competent IT managers and leaders from from less so is you know having a deep understanding of the of the policy or the processes in place, and I, and I mean that you know whether there's specific service delivery processes or the, even the legislation uh, that's behind them, um, because it it elevates your capacity to uh, have an informed discussion with the business owner uh, and with the you know the leadership within within agencies and departments, um, and, and and you know ultimately you want to be that sort of strategic advisor or you know, your, your views sought. And the reason why you want to have that is that um, it gives you the insight into how to apply um, uh, both current technology and emerging technology uh, in the context of delivering that program. Um, and, you know, many, many, many business people that I interact with, they think about um, technologies that they're familiar with. You know, they use apps. Uh, they use web forms or whatever. Um, so that's their kind of mindset. When they, and when they craft the policy, they'll think about it in terms of leveraging that technology to implement. Um, whereas if you get the CIO in the room or someone, um, a CTO or whoever, or, or one of the leaders in IT um, who's monitoring the changes in the marketplace or just familiar with other ways of doing stuff, you can often radically change the thinking about how to do something. And that goes back to our, our comment about automation. You know, the, the more we can automate um, in terms of supporting uh, citizens and businesses in their in, engaged government, um, the better it is for all parties. You get much higher levels of data accuracy, much lower costs, uh, much greater efficiencies, both in the, particularly for, for businesses. Um, 
and for citizens, it just takes a hassle out of their life. Um, yeah, so you know, it's there are. Yeah, I mean, it, so that, that's I guess the key thing: C- getting yeah, getting an understanding of the business yeah. and processes of the, yeah. of the of the agency that you're that you're working for. And as you say, everyone's using apps now. I mean, since COVID, we've seen all uh, engagement with with technology really rise across Australia. Uh, with with all the COVID tracking apps and the like. So, I mean, some have been successful, some haven't. Um, but clearly, I'm, I mean, there is an opportunity to for government. Now we've got a new government in place to, to improve confidence, citizen confidence in government services, because I think we can only go up from here, right? Um, look, you say that, uh, and, you know, it, it hasn't always been this bad. Um, and, and, you know, not to, not to kind of, um, you know, um, uh, reflect on my own time in government, but um, uh, I don't know if you remember, but when when the coalition government came to power in 2013, they announced that they were going to commission uh, a major review into the previous three years of ICT projects and expenditure and such things. Um, uh, some people describe that as a bit of a dirt digging activity, uh, and it would, and, and I'm sure that the uh, the hope was that it would be lead to lots of embarrassing questions that the government benches could ask the opposition, or sorry, could 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 comment the opposition in question time. Um, uh, the, in in fact, that report was never issued. Um, it only came to be public as a result of the journalists issuing an FOI request. And what that report showed was that largely there was reliable IT. Uh, delivered um, during those three years, and why that's important is that it, it correlated strongly with the uh, with a presentation I've given at CEDA uh, in early 2013 that we had got very good at a GMO of delivering you know IT on on time uh, to spec on budget. What we hadn't done is we or what we had lost our way on was innovation. Um, you know, quite a few of my staff were unhappy about me saying that we weren't doing well on the innovation front, but the reality was we weren't. And, you know, in, in many ways, innovation is kind of a, uh, an alternative word for transformation. Um, and I, and I, and I did, I did uh, think that um, when the DTO was established that that might be the context for us to regain momentum in that space. Mm. Uh, not to be, but unfortunately. It so, uh, unfortunately. And, and we, yeah, we went from having, you know, doing really well on one front and not really well on another to doing badly on both. Um, and and that's, that's incredibly disappointing to me personally. I think, uh, you know, it's um, very upsetting. I can understand that. Well, fingers crossed for the next few years anyway. <laughs> Listen, yes. we, will leave, we will leave it there. Thank you very much, Glenn, for, for being okay. part of Leadership Live today. We've really appreciated the discussion and uh, hopefully we can chat again soon. I look forward to it.